And I want to welcome everybody uh, to this discussion, uh, our Leaders in Communication discussion. Um, we, in these discussion series, what we do is we hear from prominent media leaders, uh, people of color who are at the um, center of important discussions when it comes to mass media, important discussions in terms of their leadership positions and their path. And what we want to do is talk about some of those, uh, the way those things uh, are hitting them and what issues they see confronting the profession, uh, as well as some, uh, some advice that uh, people generally want to have or, 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 or do have for folks uh, like a lot of you who are students uh, in the Newhouse School and elsewhere and who are looking to move forward and start to do some of these kinds of positions and become leaders yourselves. And so, and so as you can see, Jonathan Capehart is here with us uh, with what is clearly one of the best backgrounds uh, I think uh, exists in Zoom land. It's really marvelous. Uh, but, uh, but a little bit about Jonathan in case you don't know, uh, and many of you do, I know. Um, he's had a 30 year career in journalism and politics and often at the crossroads of those things. Uh, he is now the opinion columnist and opinion columnist for the Washington Post. Uh, he also is co-host of uh, MSNBC's The Sunday Show and a frequent guest on content on MSNBC. Uh, he has uh, done a number of things previous to that. He reported for the New York Daily News. Uh, he worked for Bloomberg, uh, took a little detour from Bloomberg to write speeches for Michael Bloomberg during his uh, run for mayor of New York. Uh, and so a, a, a tremendous career for a lot of reasons. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of accolades, including the fact that he is a winner of the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing. Um, he's also hosting a podcast, so uh, he's he's up with the stuff that you young folks are doing. Uh, so uh, it's called Cape Up with John Capehart. Episodes drop on Tuesdays, uh, and uh, please, please have a look uh, where you get your podcasts, as they like to say. Um, Welcome, Jonathan. It's, it's so good to have you here. Thank you very much, Hub. Thank you very much. And sorry for, again, for being a little late and <laughs> realizing a little too late that we were we were all the way live. <laughs> <laughs> not not all a problem. Not all a problem. Um, hey, I want to get into a few things. And, and it's, it's it, this is uh, this is this is, you know, a nice little, you know, fun kind of off the beaten path start of this whole thing. But I think we we um, are sitting here in the midst of some very serious times, and um, I have a lot of questions for you about your path and about some of the things that you might have in terms of advice and stuff like that. And also, by the way, uh, for those of you uh, who have questions, if you can drop those questions into the uh, Q and A uh, in this uh, in this webinar, we'll be able to address those uh, and uh, and get uh, Jonathan to answer them. Uh, and so I think there, I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions uh, as we, as we uh, go forward here. But I kind of wanted to start us out a little bit about this moment um, here with the uh, Derek Chauvin trial happening in Minneapolis, uh, the Dante Wright shooting just outside of Minneapolis. Um, so many things that have happened mm -hmm. this past week. This is uh, an incredibly, uh, incredibly tremendous, momentous uh, time of danger. And I think of trauma uh, among those uh, who not just view the news, read the news, but also cover the news. And um, you had texted earlier um, in the week uh, in, in, in sort of reaction to the, uh, the shooting this week uh, that, uh, that these are the reasons why African-American men are terrified of traffic stops uh, with, the, with the police. Um, and I know to me, uh, I related to that viscerally. I've been stopped by the police uh, on more than one occasion um, on at times when it was pretty obvious to me that I wasn't breaking any law. Um, but at the time, um, you, you go through the drill. You know, you, you do what you're told. You put your hands where people can see them. You do the whole nine yards. Um, it, it's a tough time to be uh, in that kind of situation and see that happen again and again, like a like a repeat. Um, how is it? How how is it hitting you as a professional, as as a man of color, as a journalist right now? Um, it, it's hitting hard because it's not just what's happened this week 
mm -hmm. or um, <clears throat> or with George Floyd or with Lieutenant Nazario. Um, this is a cumulative thing. And I take it all the way back to the killing of Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. when um, it, sort of, it sort of hit me <clears throat> for some reason um, like nothing else had hit me before. And I was way in on that case. I followed it from beginning to end. I read every legal brief. I, I even read the autopsy report. I, read, I followed everything. And um, I remember writing a piece, um, the very first piece I wrote where I think the opening line was, one of the hard, one of the hard parts of being African-American is carrying the weight of other people's suspicions. And then I started, I, you know, reported on what, you know, Trayvon Martin. And then I related it back to my own personal experience, how my mom, you know, had the talk with me and told me and gave me these rules, you know, don't run in public. Just definitely don't run in public with anything in your hands and a whole lot of other, a whole lot of other rules. What was so interesting was the reaction that I got. African-Americans on Twitter and on Facebook and in my inbox were flooding me with, I had the same talk and here is what I was taught. But what was really interesting was the reaction I got from white people, particularly white colleagues who could not wrap their heads around the fact that this kind of conversation was happening in black households. I had one uh, MSNBC colleague, tears in her eyes who said, it never would occur to me in a million years to have a conversation with my 16 year old that your mother had to have with you or with you know, my colleagues would have to have with their kids and it broke our heart. Um, this is where I, I once again was uh, acquainted with the power of journalism and the power of opinion writing that because I told my personal story, it made it possible for people to have a way in to see something from um, another perspective and then to take it to heart. I tell you that a whole story because that was Trayvon Martin. Fast forward and we get to, I can't even remember which horrific video that came out where I, I don't know, how could I not forget? It was George Floyd, where it was, I, st I still have not watched from beginning to end. <clears throat> when we thought it was eight minutes and 46 seconds, I watched maybe a minute of it and then I couldn't take it anymore. Just could not take it. I could not take watching another black man being killed on video. And, and, you know, and I would make a point of saying that in our editorial board meetings at the paper, I would say I've not watched it because I can't do it because it's too painful. Um, at, you know, at MSNBC, we have a policy of not showing the video, which is great. But this past weekend, when we had the, the video of Lieutenant Nazario, um, that was all over our air Saturday and Sunday, I still, I had refused to watch it. My husband said to me, have you seen this video? Oh my God, it's so upsetting. I said, no, just flat out no. And um, I get in Sunday morning and there's this push to put it, to put it on in my two hours, you know, lead the show with it. And I was like, N no, no, I, we will do this in, our Sunday show kind of sort of way. And we did, you know, we played it, but once it was done, I made it clear on air that I did, you know, I had avoided watching it. It's disturbing. I'm tired of seeing this, um, but it allowed me to make the point that when you are black and especially if you are a black male in America, there is no such thing as a routine traffic stop. Yeah. And so the great thing about being an opinion writer is that you know opinion writers are reporters we do our own reporting we have we have the freedom and the privilege of being able to say what we think about what we've reported and so you know it's it's hard it's very it gets to be very difficult 
Um, and thankfully I've gotten to a point um, in my career where I can take a step back and say, you know, nope, not this time. Nope, don't want to talk about it. Nope, don't want to touch it. Uh, particularly um, in my writings, on my writing side. On the show side, it's a little bit different. But, you know, given the videos that we've seen, the four years of Trump, it was just sort of, you know what, I need some self care. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what I'm going to do is do the crossword puzzle and watch Casino Royale for the 500th time. <laughs> Is that a favorite movie, uh, Casino Royale? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, the great... Daniel, all the Daniel Craig 007s, those are the best, except for Quantum of Solace. Not so oh, good. Oh, okay. Not so much. <laughs> gotcha. Man. Gotcha. No, I hear you. I mean, I think that uh, we, we um, especially in journalism, uh, I mean, the first few lessons that you learn, I think, as a, as a new journalist, as a young journalist, are about dealing with trauma. It's, it's somebody else's trauma. You, you, you walk up uh, and uh, oftentimes you're doing a story and it's the worst day of somebody's life. And there you are. And so these things are a big part of it. And that can, that can, be, an, that can be something that you would absorb, that we all can absorb. But when it's striking you so personally uh, that you can, you, can, you can be a part of, of the story almost, you could be on your way to that type of story and get pulled over. And, and then you are, you are part of that story. And it's, so it's a special, it, it's, it's a very difficult place to be. What, talk to me about what you would say to a, a, a younger version of yourself just mm. starting out in journalism and dealing with these kinds of things. Uh, I would probably tell myself and tell the younger versions of me who are probably watching um, is to be mindful of the impact these stories might be having on you. And to be honest with yourself and with your, with your employers, with your editors, with your professors and say, you know, I just need a minute, or I need to talk to somebody about this, or I can't, I just can't do it right now. Um, and I say that all within the confines of the profession. I mean, you can't just go to your editor, editor or you know, your, um, your bosses and say, well, I don't feel like uh, covering this. Uh, that's not gonna work. But if you are, if you are physically um, having a physical reaction to having to report on something that, it, that strikes close to home, I would hope that to whom, whoever you're reporting will be empathetic enough to say, you know what, my reporter needs, needs some time and we will, find, we will find a way to get the reporting on this because in the end, yeah, sure, the story is important but the reporter reporting the story that gets on the air, that gets into, into print somehow, that person is actually more important because you burn that, if you burn yourself out, mm -hmm. then, you're no, then that's a loss for the profession. That's a loss for your publication. That's a loss for, for your broadcast or podcast or untold number of <laughs> platforms that are out there now that weren't out there when um, I was breaking into the business. So self-care, I think, would be the, the, number one, the number one thing. There are no rewards and no awards for toughing it out and then collapsing. They yeah. just aren't. They just aren't. And, and so find yourself an editor. Find yourself a news manager, a news director who understands the importance of that as well is a, is, is, is a good way going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about this moment. Let's talk a little bit about where we are. Um, at the crossroads of this, this difficult trial going on in, in Minnesota. And, and, yet, and yet and still things are still happening again and again and again. And, and, and I think that we, um, we really do get into almost a loop. Um, I, I think you had referenced a, um, uh, the Netflix short, um, the, the, um, the, the oh, Stranger, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's a, the, the 32 minute documentary whose yes. title, Michelle Norris wrote a column about it uh, that's in the paper today and I tweeted it out. I, I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about watching it. I wanna watch it, 
but I'm but I'm scared. But go you on. Prepare Hubs. yourself because you know what I did watch it. Oh, you did. <laughs> okay. And it is. It's 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 very very tough. It very it's a very difficult thing to watch. Um, and um, and it's but it but it's worth watching if you can get to because it basically, folks, the idea of this piece is that um, uh, that it's almost like a Groundhog Day. Right. And the whole gist of it is a, a, a black man wakes up every morning, has an encounter with a, with a police officer and is killed. And then he wakes up again and has an encounter with a police officer and is killed again and again and again. And um, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to watch. Um, but, it, but it surfaces at this point at a moment when we're having a national conversation around these kinds of things. And one of the bigger one of the bigger questions I have is, so what becomes of this conversation? Is it different than what we've had before? Are we at a different place? Um, are you surprised at where we are? So it's a whole bunch of different questions. Uh -huh. But let's start with: Are you surprised with where we are? Um, well, knowing what I know now, no, I'm not surprised. You know, we are where we are because, in a in a in a way, America has been going through a Groundhog Day. When it comes when it comes to um, these issues, but I do think we are in a in a different place, and this this is what makes me hopeful mm -hmm. amid the amidst the misery. The profession has changed, the nature of the conversation has changed, yes. and so now you have reporters who are more sensitive to these to these topics to these subjects. But you also have black reporters who are out there and are able to report on these stories and tell these stories with the nuance that they deserve and never got before. And then on top of that, you have editors and news directors and managers who themselves might be, might be black. But even if they aren't black, they recognize that they have in their black reporter a, an incredible resource. And so you can turn on the television and you can see an array of black reporters in Minnesota or just on air commenting, talking about the trial, what it means, the, the uh, Dante Wright shooting, what it means, why black people are upset. I mean, the level of conversation that we're having today, I wish we had when Rodney King Mm -hmm. when the Rodney King trial was happening. And that was the first, I think that was indeed the first case where you, you had videotaped, and it was taped then, videotaped yeah. evidence of a police beating. Mm -hmm. But the nature of the conversation was completely different. Um, even if the arguments in court seemed to be about the same, mm -hmm. but the conversation <laughs> The conversation in the country on television among the reporters who are reporting on the story is, is completely different. It's much more nuanced. It's much more knowing. Um, that's not to say that the reporting is perfect, but if you were to go back 30 years and watch the coverage of the Rodney King, the Rodney King trial and everything that happened after the trial with the riots, it, you would be appalled by by what you saw what you heard and by the lack of diversity um among the reporters who were reporting on it mm -hmm. the, there are voices now that we hear that we didn't get a chance to hear before and, and even as we see pictures that we didn't get much of a chance to see before i mean the reason why we know of rodney king is because of the video the reason why we know so many of these is because of the ubiquity of phone camera video and and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of that so it's changed the conversation um what gives you hope in all of this? Um, are there things as you take a look going forward that um, that even in this difficult moment uh, give you some hope? Um, oh, well, I mean, what I just said before, just the nature of reporting now and the reporters who, who are reporting on the story, that gives me hope. But also what gives me hope is that the, the generation that's coming up, I mean, I just saw on Twitter, David Hogg, um, from Parkland, um, just turned 21. So now he's legal. He tweeted out a picture of himself having a drink, um, his first drink as a, as a legal adult. That generation right there is what gives me hope. 
because when Parkland happened, and we and talk about a Groundhog Day, talk about a loop, the number of mass shootings that have been happening in this country. And it was in Parkland, right smack really in the middle of Donald Trump being president of the United States. So we're, I mean, just down in the dumps, what's happening to us, what's happening to our country. Parkland, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School has the incident and, and, I, and I purposely call them kids. These kids got on social media while it was happening, telling the world what was happening. And then afterwards, the level of activism that they engaged in was just awe-inspiring. And I remember sitting at my desk um, back in the days when we were in the office and I'm watching television and there's a rally with some of the Parkland kids in Tallahassee, in the state capitol, demanding action uh, on guns, on gun, for gun safety. And I can't remember the name of the particular kid who spoke, but he said, this is the cause of my life. I'm gonna do everything I can to change this. I know it's going to take a long time. It's not gonna happen in one month, five months, five years, but it will happen in my lifetime. And I'm dedicating myself to that. Tears started streaming down my, out of my eyes, down my face. Why? Because here's a kid who lives in a country where he can have anything he wants or get access to anything he wants. Oh, I was reaching for my phone, on, on his phone. We live in an instantaneous society. And yet here's this, this next generation kid who has the long-term outlook to say, this answer is not gonna be, it's not gonna come easily. It's gonna be years down the road, but it's going to be in my lifetime. And that's when I thought, we're gonna be okay. And, and what really impressed me by um, the Parkland kids is how they, have, they had such presence of mind to understand that they weren't the first to ever be involved in a mass shooting. They recognize that they're, that, you know, other kids in their generation in Chicago had been dealing with it for much longer than they had and reached out to them and included, pulled them in, understood the privilege that they had, the platform that they had and recognized that they needed to share that in order to bring, to bring attention to, to the kids in Chicago. That to me, that is what gives me hope. That's a good, uh, very good point. Very good point. I want to get you, I want to bring you back a little bit sure. to those times when you were about that young <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit and talk a little bit about your path uh, from those days to these days. Um, you, you've had a 30 year career. You've been in, you, you've been in journalism as a reporter and then as, as an opinion columnist. Uh, how does that, how do you do that? How does that start for you? What, what was that like in the beginning? Well, keep in mind, my, with the exception of six months uh, where I tried to be a news side reporter at Bloomberg News after the, the mayoral campaign, my entire, other than, aside from that, my entire uh, print journalism career has been as an opinion writer. Um, I, now, I'm going to interrupt you there because one of the things you did say about, as we talked before about opinion writers is you still have to be a bit of a reporter to be an opinion writer. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, not a bit of a reporter. You have to be a reporter. You've got to pick up the phone. You've got to call people. You've got to seek information. You've got to talk to public officials. You've got to interview them. You got to find out what's going on. And as I said before, the beauty of being an opinion writer is once you've done all that reporting and you've assembled all the facts, then you get to say, here's what I think about what I, find, what I found out. And just as an aside, so one editorial I had to write on the city budget this is in New York City. Giuliani was mayor, mm -hmm. did all this reporting. I talked to the press secretary. Um, I read the budget and then wrote this editorial that said, you know, this basically this budget's crap. 
<laughs> like it doesn't do what the mayor says he wants it to do, that the priorities are misaligned, whatever it is I said. I, you know, I get to work early, or at least we used to get to work early. My phone rang and I heard, please hold for the mayor. I was like, oh, Giuliani gets on and said, Jonathan, uh, Mr. Mayor, good morning. And then he goes off on a tear, 20 minutes screaming <laughs> at me, go, almost going line by line through the editorial, how I was wrong and why I was wrong. Then apparently they went under a bridge and the signal dropped. And I hung up the phone. I was just like, I can't believe. Sure enough, two minutes later, the phone rings. Jonathan Capehart. And another thing, another 20 minutes screaming on the phone. But so that's why that's you know part of the career of being a reporter, but also you know, having the mayor of the country's largest city call and chew you out. But my interest in journalism actually started by watching the Today Show. And I'd been watching the Today Show since I was 10. And, um, and I'm going to truncate the story, but I got, myself, um, <clears throat> I got myself an internship on the Today Show. And then after graduating college, I went to Carleton in Minnesota. After graduating Carleton, from Carleton, I went to WNYC as assistant to the president. And then as a result of the Rodney King um, no, I took a two, week, a two week vacation from WNYC to go to work at the Today Show as a, as a temp. I met, I, I met a person there um, who was the wunderkin of the researchers. He was like 23 years old and the executive producer of the Today Show, Jeff Zucker, who is now the president of CNN, yeah. uh, sent him everywhere, Somalia, Haiti, uh, and then sent him to LA. So now fast forward, um, this is pre-cell phones. So I picked up my touch tone phone. We talked on the phone and he said, oh my God, I'm so tired. I'm out here in LA, the riots, we need more researchers. I said, hey, I, where do I send my resume? Fast forward, I get, the, I get uh, rehired at the t um, uh, as a vacation relief, only a guarantee of three months, mm -hmm. no health care. Um, and so I left a full-time secure job at WNYC. I took a leap, a leap, I took a risk and a chance on myself and went to the, to the Today Show as a researcher. I ended up staying like a week short of a year because I had gotten a call from the New York Daily News uh, uh, op-ed editor a new publisher had bought the paper, was looking for young people who could write for the editorial page, got my name, we talked, and I got hired. And my first job in newspapers was at the New York Daily News as an editorial writer. Uh, if you want to know all the nitty gritty detail, watch the byline from my first, my first show on December 13th. I walked through the story. <laughs> in a little more detail. <laughs> oh, indeed. Um, and, and yeah, you did have um, uh, a lot of, of interesting interactions. Um, uh, you had, um, you, you'd uh, worked with uh, a number of different people. You, you had an interaction with a um, network news president uh, ah. where, you're, where you had some you know, it maybe didn't go the way you wanted it to go. So uh, how, how did, what, what happened there and what impact did that have on your trajectory? Okay, so we're gonna, so I'm gonna put a pin in that particular story because that okay. story won't make sense until oh. I tell you, until I tell you that. So I was at the Daily News for seven years. We win the Pulitzer. And then yeah. I thought, now is my time to jump. Now is my time to go national. And so, I was looking to jump to a bigger, a bigger platform. I made my way to Bloomberg, my, made my way to Bloomberg News. Um, I didn't want to go to Bloomberg News. A friend kept telling me, you should interview at Bloomberg. And I was like, that's financial news. I don't know anything about financial news. That's numbers. I'm a journalist, but I can't, <laughs> I write. Um, and so just as a courtesy to my friend, I take this meeting um, I go to this meeting at Bloomberg News. It was a horrible day in New York. It was raining. 
I couldn't get a cab. I was late. I didn't have an umbrella. I was soaked. I was in a foul mood when I got to Bloomberg headquarters. Uh, then it was at 499 Park Avenue, come off the elevator. <clears throat> and I, ha I don't have a poker face. In fact, I'm a, a, an acute sufferer of RBF. <laughs> and so I know he saw me, the, the then editor of Bloomberg saw me and was like, whoa. We sit down, he gives me a tour of Bloomberg. And then he shows me the terminal and says, okay, so what do you think? And I said, think about what? You know, what do you think about coming to work here? I said, I, I don't think that's a good idea. This is financial news. I don't want to, I mean, that's not my thing. So um, this has been very nice, um, but thank you. And he got angry, justifiably so, and, and said to me, ask me this question. Well, what do you want to do? And he said it just like that. And then wow. leaned back in his chair with his arms folded. And I was like, I'm wet, my feet, my feet are wet, I'm, I'm mad, I wanna get out of here. And so I just threw caution to the wind and I looked him dead in the eye and I said, I wanna write a column once a week and go on television and talk about it just like I do right now. And then I sat back like this. <laughs> Four beats go by and then he leans forward and goes, well, why can't you do that here? And then start showing me how Bloomberg News started offering opinion content to their subscribers and then started going through all of this stuff. And I freaked out. I yeah. cut that meeting short and I left. Ooh. Fast forward, I then leave, leave the Daily News to join Bloomberg News where he basically threw a bag of money at me and said, come here, write a column once a week. Your title is um, national affairs columnist go wherever you need to go to report the story, write once a week. You could write more than that if you want. It was by far one of the best jobs I've ever had. Um, and he was true to his word. I traveled everywhere. It was fantastic. But then Mike Bloomberg decides he wants to run for mayor. And um, his, his key lieutenant, uh, Kevin Sheiky and I were here, here in Washington at um, inauguration. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Bush's, Bush's, um, yeah, uh, actually Bush's George Bush. W. Bush's first, first inauguration. And he's asking me all these questions, you know, Mike's thinking of running for mayor and asking me all these questions. And I said, you know, look, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I've been telling you the, the, all this. And I asked, well, why are you asking me all these questions? And he said, well, we're, I said, is Mike running for mayor? And he said, well, that's what we're hoping you'd help us with. And so I then left Bloomberg News and journalism to work on a political campaign. As a, as a political reporter and editorial writer and columnist, I had always wondered what would it be like to work on a campaign? And so I got to work on a campaign and uh, learned a lot, but I missed journalism, especially after you know, missing the biggest story of journalism at that time, which was the attacks of 9-11. I went back to Bloomberg News um, as a news side reporter, as I said, a correspondent for global poverty. I was told to spin the globe, po poke my finger in, and wherever my finger hit, figure out the poverty angle and go. My finger hit Kenya. So I, had a, a, I went to Kenya. But then I went back to the Daily News as deputy editorial page editor, but then left again and went to corporate PR for two years. And that was, whew, um, that was a slow agonizing daily, <laughs> daily oh, death no. for two years. It was bad, but as a report, as a journalist at heart, seeing, seeing the world from the other side of the wall was illuminating, wow. but I get a call from the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, says, I've got an opening. I'm like, oh my God, I'll do it if you hire me. I leave, after 16 years in New York, I leave New York, move to Washington within one month, and I've been here for 14, for 14 years. I tell you all that to get to the story that, that Hub is alluding to, and that is, I got a message that the president of a network, news network, 
the news president of a network wanted to meet with me. No explanation, just wants to meet with you. Listen to me. When a network news president asks to meet with you, it doesn't matter. You just, you go. So I went and he's put, I hadn't had a conversation like this. I didn't think it was an interview or anything, but it, it was kind of rough. And at one point he says to me, so I'm looking at your resume here. And there, I mean, the last 10 years or so, you've been all over the place. Daily News, Bloomberg News, the campaign, back to Bloomberg News, Hill and Knowlton. I mean, what? And now you're at the Washington. I, why? What is going on here? But what? Yeah, what's one of those questions? Right. Why shouldn't? No, this is what he's asking me. What's going oh, on okay. here? But why should I? I mean, were there issues? How does that affect? And I just looked at him and I said, you could see that as. Um, sort of haphazard. He was asking about my career. It seems haphazard. So you might see that as haphazard, but you know, when I went to the Bloomberg campaign, I went because as a political journalist, I always wondered what it would be like to work on a political campaign. I got to, I got to do it. And on a self-funded campaign that actually won. So that gave me some insight into um, what it's like to work on a political campaign. And I think when I went back to, um, um, certainly back to the daily news, it informed my thinking around editorials and columns when you know mayors, other mayor's races and the governor's race and stuff like that. So that's been helpful. And then with Hill and Knowlton, you know, yeah, that was a, a, a trip to the dark side, but what it did was finely tune my BS detector because now I know all the tactics and things that people use to make news or, or hide news or whatever. So, and now I'm at the Washington Post on the editorial board and I write columns and I go on television and I give my analysis. And so what you see as haphazard, I see as putting in the building blocks of my career that actually give me more authority to talk about the things that I, and write about the things that I do. And then he looked at me and sat back and gave me this, this smirk and says, you don't know why you're here, do you? <laughs> and I didn't, and I'm not gonna tell you um, why I was there, but it was a, a very instructive moment. <laughs> you never know what folks are thinking, but you always take the meeting. Right, always take the meeting. Always take the meeting. Um, fast forward to now, um, I want to talk a little bit about, and, and there are a number of questions that are coming up about um, the nature of journalism, the nature of opinion, uh, those sorts of things. So we're going to get into some of that. Um, what about uh, being on an opinion network now, being part of an entire sort of opinion universe, basically, uh, which MSNBC kind of is, um, what about that uh, to you really contributes to that national discourse uh, and, and, and where is its place in, in, in your mind? Well, I think, you know, especially folks, if they're, if they're watching MSNBC and certainly if they're watching the, the point of view programming that comes, that comes on in prime time or really starting at four, four o'clock with, with uh, Nicole Wallace uh, and then on the weekends, um, these are folks who, the, news junkies, yeah. like they're, they're either news junkies or politics junkies. So they know what's going on, but they turn to us because they want to put it into context. Why should they care about this story? Why is this, this story important? How does it fit into the larger story that's going on in the country? And so as an opinion writer, being on a network like MSNBC and having the show that I have, I mean, it's, it, it, what I do at MSNBC is what I do at The Post. It's just a different, it's just a different medium. And I think that what we do, I know there are a lot of people who are, you know, sort of look down on point of view television, but it has a role to play. Because like I said, people want to know I mean, people tune into Rachel Maddow because they, they know her, they trust her, and she is presenting facts 
you know, facts from a point of view, but you can verify everything that she's talking about. And so, at a, especially during, during the Trump administration with Russia and everything, she was appointment television because there was no one else in this business, television, print, magazine, digital, whatever, no one else in the United States in our profession knew more about the ins and outs of what was going on with Trump and Russia and everything than Rachel Maddow. And thank goodness that she had the ability to say what she thought about the reporting that she had done. And so I, I know there are some people who think that this is you know, bad for the profession and this is bad news. And I don't, I don't agree with that. I would argue that on the other side, that news consumers need to become more, um, more sophisticated. Don't just get your news from MSNBC. Don't just get your news from CNN. Certainly don't just get your news from Fox, but do a combination of, of all three get your news from multiple sources. When, when you do that, you end up getting a fuller view of, the, of what's happening. Are you tuning into Fox on a regular basis? <laughs> I do not practice what I preach when it comes to that. But then again, I'm talking, I, I, I'm talking about news. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you know, there were years ago, my husband would say to me, he would put on Laura Ingram, this is, during the Obama years. And I would complain, I was like, why are we watching this? He goes, we have to know what the other side is, is saying. And so he puts it on. I lasted um, about a half hour mm. because I started yelling back at the TV because she was saying things that I knew were false because of my own reporting. And so I was like, I can't sit here and watch this. These are lies. And then everything, all every segment, no matter what it was about, led back to Hillary Clinton and how quote unquote corrupt she was. And so I thought this is this is of no use. So I went upstairs. All yeah. roads led to Hillary in those days, you know. Yeah. Just pretty much all roads. Right. Um, but that does give us that 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 does give us the uh, uh, the notion that a lot of people run up against the the idea that media outlets have this obligation to present both sides of the story. And, and, and so there's a bit of that sort of both sides ism that, um, that still pervades sort of the new side of things. And, and, and how, do you, um, how do you deal with some of those issues around, around both sides? First of all, does, does a journalist, should we, be, should we be just honing in on both sides in the journalism world? Well, look, I mean, it, again, that's another luxury of being on the opinion side I don't, I mean, I can talk to the other side and hear them out, but in the end, I know where I stand. I think the profession had, a, had to have a hard conversation with itself during the, the Trump years because both sides, that both sides thing came crumbling down during the Trump years. How can you say that there are both sides to an issue when it comes to Charlottesville? How do you come down on both sides when it comes to the president of the United States being impeached? And so, or the president saying flat out lies and how long it took the profession to actually, by his last year, year and a half, there were reporters on television just flat, the president lied today. Yeah. Whereas earlier in, her, in his term, there were news side reporters for whom saying the president lied was really difficult simply because that's not just not what we did. Yeah. Presidents, sure, presidents lie, but we're talking shading of the truth and stuff like that. We had a president who outright lied and lied for seemingly no reason and you had reporters who had to who had to confront that and they did and so i think that is that is good for the profession because the both sides thing the objectivity um which i know a lot of a lot of news side reporters hold sacrosanct and they should but that should not be used that they should not that objectivity should not become a blinder to what's actually happening. 
like I don't see anyone running to get the other side of the argument in the killing of George Floyd. That is actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, or see anyone trying to run to the other side and, and get a quote from the Klan or the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers to see what they have to say about um, the whole conversation about white supremacy. I, th th there's no need for it. Uh, oh, well, the New York Times did that piece about the uh, white supremacist. The white supremacist who lives next door. Uh, the white supremacist next door. Right. And, but, you know, thanks to social media, I mean, they got dragged <laughs> and dragged hard. Yeah. But as a result of that, you know, they learn. And actually, they, got, they had to be dragged a few times on some things. Mm -hmm. um, they learned that there's no appetite for that kind of reporting if you're not going to give the same level of reporting to, so much was written about the, the forgotten Trump voter, mm -hmm. but nothing really was written about, oh, well, wait a minute, what about all those people who voted for Hillary? I mean, she did get 3 million more votes. What about them? My colleague, Gene Robinson, wrote a column right after Biden won the presidency. And it was a, a spin on that, on that trope. And that was, if you wanna understand the Biden voter, here's what you, here, here are the things you should read. Here are the things you should know. Uh, and that I think was a great clever way of pushing back against you know, the Klansman next door. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they, there's been so many efforts to sort of understand, you know, the the um, hillbilly elegy and things like that that um, mm -hmm. that uh, became sort of a, a whole genre. It seems. Uh, I'm going to turn the page just a little bit, get to sure. a couple of different questions. One of them, um, uh, the your your segment in your show, the Aunt Gloria segment. <laughs> yeah. What's what's the inspiration behind that? So um, explain a little bit for those people who are not. Right. So I was at my family barbecue in August 2019. No, 2018. Mm -hmm. August 2018. And, um, you know, the presidential race was about to get underway. And I asked, my, my husband said to me, you know, you've got a yard full of Black people in North Carolina. You should ask them who they're voting for. For, for president. And I thought, oh, actually that's kind of, that's real smart. So I'll do that. And so Aunt Gloria was one of the first people I talked to and she gave me the money quote. And that was, um, it's gotta be an old white man against an old white man because the system is so racist. Um, it's gotta be old school against old school. And that's why I'm with Joe Biden. <laughs> She loved Kamala Harris, but didn't think the, the country was ready and said, Joe Biden is the one. And so I went around the yard and Joe Biden got a, most of the votes. And I write this piece and it takes off mm -hmm. uh, because of that quote. Yeah. And so I start quoting and I start quoting Aunt Gloria in other pieces. And then people started asking me on Twitter when things would happen during the campaign. Well, I want to know what Aunt Gloria thinks. I want to know what Aunt Gloria thinks. Mm -hmm. And so I would interview her. She would send me messages. And she, even when people were running away from Joe Biden, mm -hmm. she was like, nope, Joe Biden, Joe Biden is my guy. And then, jo and then Joe Biden wins. And, you know, now everyone's like, oh my God, Aunt Gloria's right. Aunt Gloria's right. So when I got the show, people asked me, so when do we get to meet Aunt Gloria? We need to see Aunt Gloria. And so I had her on, I think maybe the third or fourth show. Mm -hmm. And whenever I wrote about her in a thing, she trended on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> whenever she's been on tele, whenever she's been on my show, she trends on Twitter. And uh, I should go back, I'll go back and look at the ratings, but I do think that when she has been on, you know, the, the ratings hold or they, or they go up. And I think what's so, I think why Aunt Gloria resonates with people is because she's just everyday folks who mm -hmm. loves politics and loves talking about politics, um, but is just very, she's just very real. She's not involved in politics at all, 
but she pays attention and she comes on and she says, she just says what a lot of people think and what a lot of people feel. I had her on recently to ask her about the Chauvin trial because I thought, you know, this might be a time for Aunt Gloria to say something. And she comes on and she said, actually she told our producers that she had, when they asked her to come on, she said, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't watched any of the trial. And I said, when they told me that, and she's, you know, she, she told them that she would read up and watch. I said, actually, the fact that she said that is saying something. And so she comes on the show. She, by then she had watched some clips and stuff. And I said, you originally had not watched. Why? And what she had to say resonated with people. She said, I, I can't watch this anymore. It's too painful. Um, it's too scary. It's too frightening. This keeps happening all the time. And then I asked her, so do you think he'll be found guilty? And she said, no, I think it'll be a hung jury. And she just went there Wow. and she spoke for a lot of people. If you look at some of the commentary out there, Gene, Gene Robinson earlier this week, or maybe last week had a column about he would love for Chauvin to be found guilty, but there's a part of him that just thinks that he's, he's going to get away with it somehow. And Aunt Gloria, Aunt Gloria said that on air. And so that's the, where Aunt Gloria comes from. Um, she's become sort of this every woman. And that's why we started this segment. We call it The Way I See It. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically Aunt Gloria's slot. And then if we can find someone else who is Aunt Gloria-like, we do that segment. So we've had um, um, Rob Reiner in that slot and we had um, Mandy Patinkin and, and his wife, uh, Catherine Grody in, in that spot. So you got people who will just swing for the fences in there and, and, and really tell you the real deal. Yeah, just being, just being real, just being themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it just speaks to the wisdom of, of you, know, you know, listen to what you hear at the cookout. You'll get wisdom at the cookout. Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, it's so true. Um, speaking of guests, um, what, what is the process for uh, you know, deciding the segments and guests on your show? What is that like? What do you do? Um, so actually today was, um, is sort of day one. Mm -hmm. And by 9 a.m. I have to send in to the senior producers sort of my list of segments that I think I think as of right now we should be doing, and then the names of potential guests and the way I'm viewing the segment, how I think it should go. Keep in mind, it's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So by, and then we have a big um, show meeting with all the segment producers tomorrow where we go through, um, go through the segments as we have them, potential guests, um, see if there's anything else that's popped up that might knock something out. And then we talk again on Saturday. And so by Saturday um, is when the show is fully baked, mm -hmm. but things could happen and knock things out or either news wise, or we might get a big name guest and something gets knocked out. So we had um, scheduled um, a race in America segment on um, this author, Rebecca Carroll, who is you know, my podcast guest this week but to talk about her book, um, Surviving the White Gaze, a memoir. And, but then we got former Senate uh, Majority Leader, Harry Reid to come on and talk about the filibuster and Joe Manchin and, and Mitch McConnell. And we had to cancel Rebecca Carroll, mm -hmm. but she's gonna, but we're gonna have her on because um, she was great. Uh, and so those are the things that um, how, those decisions are made, but the way, um, I mean, the Sunday show is meant to be a Sunday show. Um, it is news, it is, um, you know, those topics you would see on those other Sunday shows. And so we have to, we have to be nimble. Yeah. Well, and, and, and speaking of that, as far as Washington is concerned, um, it seems if you want to talk about a Groundhog Day kind of moment, it seems like the conversations around certain paradigms um, continue to happen. The, the conversation about bipartisanship, for example, everything has to be bipartisan. You know, it's, it, it, it doesn't count unless Republicans are in on it. 
if you're a Democrat or, you know, and basically only if you're a Democrat, because I don't ever hear the Republicans talking about that, quite frankly. Right. Um, no, they don't. And, and, and so um, how do journalists break out of this sort of thing? Because right now that inside the beltway and you are at inside the beltway, uh, <laughs> this inside the beltway kind of uh, 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 way of looking at things is, is so much about that process and not as much about results. What, what, what do you say about those kinds of things? Well, yeah, I mean, you are not alone. I get frustrated sometimes by the way politics is covered because, I mean, you say process, and but it really is, a lot of reporters cover politics in Washington as if it's a sport. Mm -hmm. And in some ways it is, it is a sport, but there are real life consequences. And so sometimes I wish that a lot of uh, a lot of my fellow reporters could could pull way back and understand that um, one bipartisanship to Republicans means that the Democratic president must meet with us, take our ideas, and accept them whole. Otherwise, we are not going to support what he's doing. And when that happened with the American Rescue Plan, Republicans complained, um, oh, that was just for show. He didn't listen to us. And yet he was just elected president of the United States. He met with you. You came in with a, a plan that was half of what he was proposing. He didn't like it. He has a mandate from the American people. He decided to go his own way. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, that's politics. And yet in a lot of the coverage, you don't, you don't get that second part, which is the man who was just elected by the American people with a popular vote majority and the most, most votes ever cast for anyone running for president has decided to go this way. Um, the other thing that I think that the Biden administration has actually been very smart about, they've redefined partisanship. Partisanship is not just oh, we've worked with Republicans, bipartisanship is, well, do Republicans in the country like it? Mm -hmm. And I think that has forced the press to sort of change up its coverage because, I mean, how do you argue when you've got polling out there that shows that the American Rescue Plan is really popular or that the American Jobs Plan also is kind of popular? Right. So, yeah, there's a lot of the... the, the there's some aspects of the, the Beltway sort of political sports press that drives me nuts. And it could stand yeah. to be a bit more, it could stand to be more, um, a little more substantive. Yeah. You know, I, I, we have a lot, of, uh, lot of, a lot of folks who want to do sports at the Newhouse School. You might've heard of some of those, uh, our history and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I often tell a lot of our guys and girls who want to do sports, I, I often say, you know, politics is a lot like sports, except at the end, there's the, the, the end game is a lot more consequential. You know, um, we don't, you know, we don't get to just debate people, stuff happens, power is dispensed, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. You got to watch out for that. Look, we are about, we're, we're getting down to our end here. And, and I, and I did want to give you a chance to talk to, um, our students in this uh, in this audience about whatever some what what advice you have for them in this moment at these times. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what you think they ought to be doing right now in this moment, and 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 what's your advice for them? Uh, um, well, that is broad, and as you know, I am a, a long-winded talker, so I will I will just say that I will just say this: um, if you want to be a rep if you want to be a journalist be a journalist because you care about the truth. You care about telling, you, telling the stories about issues or people or activities or events um, that you are interested in, that you care about. Mm -hmm. um, go into journalism because you want to help write the first draft of history. Go into journalism because it is um, not only a noble profession, it is the only profession protected in the Constitution of the United States. Um, but the one reason you should not go into journalism is if the only reason why you want to go into journalism is because you want to be a star. 
there are too many people in journalism who are like that. Um, if, you, if you want to be a star, please think about something else to do. But if what you want to do is to get down into an issue, into a community, into a topic, really learn the ins and outs of, of a sport or an industry or a city, a state, uh, a nation, and being able to hold people to account, to tell stories, um, to help shape a national conversation because it is in your bones, then by all means, join the profession, come to journalism. It is, it is absolutely worthwhile. That is a marvelous note to end on, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I so appreciate you giving uh, an hour of your time to, to talk with us and all the students here. And I wanted to, to, to uh, thank all of you who are a part of this webinar for, for joining us. Uh, it's been great. We will continue to do more Leaders in Communications uh, uh, events as time goes on. So stay tuned for those. And again, Jonathan, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for, for tuning in. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Take care now.